Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to a webinar here by Orbis and the New England College of Optometry on retinoscopy. I hope everybody can hear me okay, and um, I look forward to over the next hour discussing with you uh, this excellent topic of retinoscopy. My name is, is Daniel Bashan. I'm an optometrist here in the United States, specifically in Massachusetts, and I'm an assistant professor of optometry at the New England College of Optometry. I teach a first year course on theories and methods of optometry uh, to students of the institution here in Boston, Massachusetts. So I'm very excited to go over the topic of retinoscopy with you all. I see we have about 66 people listening in, so that's, that's really excellent. Um, we only have about an hour's time uh, here, and I know many of you have some excellent questions and, and some really good um, case specific questions, and I saw some of those on the registration, pre-registration. If you do have specific, more case-based questions that you'd like to go over that we may or may not have time for today, I highly encourage you to submit those questions to uh, cybersite.org, and then we'll have a little bit more time to address those questions. Um, hopefully, I can get all, uh, into some other things today. Considering uh, there's a, a large landscape of backgrounds as it relates to the topic and understanding and concepts of retinoscopy, this lecture is going to be designed to provide a solid foundation on this clinical technique, uh, addressing some of the theory and some of the methods. Um, and many of you may be a little bit more advanced and have more specific questions about how to get to the next level, which uh, I highly encourage you to submit. Uh, but I am looking to provide a nice solid foundation for everybody uh, going through this lecture. So um, before I begin, I would like to say uh, some special thank yous. First to my wife, Monica Wynn. Uh, she helped me with this lecture. She's also given a retinoscopy lecture at her hospital uh, where she works and was a big inspiration. Uh, my mentor and the person who taught me about retinoscopy, uh, Dr. Nancy Carlson, and uh, my colleague and strong support, uh, Dr. Ponsanta uh, Veradiaz, who also helped me uh, in putting this lecture together and we work closely together. I'd also like to take uh, a moment to thank Sarah Wasnig uh, and Laura Sika for their help with Orbis in putting this presentation together. So thank you so much. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I kind of wanted to get a sense of how everybody felt with their comfort level in terms of retinoscopy. So here we have a poll question. Oops, let's go back a little bit. Here we have a poll question. How comfortable are you with retinoscopy, the theory and the method? I want to get a sense of the audience. Do you feel fairly comfortable? Um, not comfortable at all, or yeah, you're feeling pretty comfortable and you're looking uh, to get a nice refresher. All right, about 42% of you said that you're uh, fairly comfortable. That's about half the group. And then almost a third said very comfortable and a third said not so comfortable. So that's great. Gives me kind of a sense as to where we're going. And then, you know, retinoscopy and refraction can be understood in both minus sill form and plus sill form. And I kind of want to get a sense of which uh, is the majority of the audience here. Are we working in minus sill or plus sill when you're providing clinical care? A lot of the cases I have today are plus sill, but they can easily be understood in minus sill as well. We're talking about simple conversions here, uh, but I did kind of want to get a sense as to where people are at with either plus sill or minus sill. And minus cell is 85% uh, of the people. Okay. In which case, we're going to go to a specific um, website to do some cases here. So what are we looking at for the next hour? We are looking to talk about what retinoscopy is, um, be on the same page about its understanding, its usage, its definition. And then once we understand what it's used for, it's best to understand how the instrument works in terms of its optics and how that relates to the patient's optics and their bar point. So that's going to be really important to understand. If we can wrap our heads around the optics of the instrument and the far points of our patients, we can better understand um, assessing the reflex, uh, both with motion, against motion, and neutrality. These are going to be what we as the clinician are going to be seeing, and so we want to be able to how to best interpret those um, and get ourselves to our endpoint, which would be neutrality. We're going to talk about the technique, and I'll go into some tips and tricks about how uh, to be careful of some common mistakes and errors that are made, um, but refreshing on the technique. Um, some case examples that I have, um, I have several, up to seven. We don't necessarily, with the interest of time, have to go through all of those, but I do think it's important to talk about some case examples and how to work through them. And I'll also pull up a website that um, you can practice yourself, and I'll show you today. We'll go through some tips as well as some retinoscopy problems. So. That's kind of a, a sense 
of what the lecture is going to be like. And here, just in this picture, you can kind of see that this technique um, can be performed on a large range of people of age groups. Um, sometimes it's with loose lenses, as we see in this picture, um, in an environment where we're trying to assess uh, objectively what this child's refractive error may be. Um, but it can be done in the examination chair with a foropter, loose lenses, lens uh, holders, lens racks as well. So what is this concept of retinoscopy that we're looking to talk about today? It's first and foremost uh, needs to be understood as an objective determination of the patient's refractive state by locating the far point of the patient's eye with the retinoscope and then using lenses to mu move the far point to the examiner's entrance pupil. And the first sentence is underlined here because it's important to understand it's an objective determination. Um, in this lecture, we're not going to be getting into subjective refraction. Um, that's where the patient's responses are brought in and we are refining um, on objective measurements, a, a starting point um, for refraction. Retinoscopy is an incredible technique because it allows us to objectively measure a person's refractive error. And being able to objectively measure it allows us to provide um, possibly clear and comfortable vision to a large population of people, many of whom I'm sure you're serving, who wouldn't necessarily be able to respond to us or maybe can't um, for whatever reason. And so it can lead to final prescriptions. It can lead to starting points of subjective refraction, but it is an objective determination. The patient's not subjectively providing any feedback. Um, so how does the retinoscopy work? Well, the retinoscopy illuminates the inside of the patient's eye, the clinician examines the light as it's reflected from the external limiting membrane of the patient's retina. An objective measurement of the prescription the patient needs for distance based solely on the optics of the patient's eye is what we're doing. And it's usually used as a starting point for subjective refraction, as I just mentioned in the previous slide here. Um, but the main key point is the clinician examines the light as it's reflected from the external limiting membrane and how we perceive that light is how we're gonna determine the refractive error of this eye. There is static and there is dynamic retinoscopy. Um, in the majority sense, we're talking about static retinoscopy as we go through this lecture. That's where a patient fixates at a distance target with their accommodation relaxed. That's very important. We wanna to try to eliminate the variable of accommodation because it's, it can change it can move in and out, and we want to keep it constant in order to better get a sense of their refractive error. That's static retinoscopy. A patient fixates on a distance target with accommodation relaxed, and the distance Rx is determined. And I'm gonna go over some tips and tricks on how you, should, how you can help to get that accommodation to relax for your patient. But if they're not, accommodation is not relaxing, then the results of the uh, retinoscopy can be a little off. Dynamic retinoscopy, on the other hand, uh, as contrast to static, a patient fixates on a near target and the status of his or her accommodation is evaluated. Okay, so that's um, more of a near type of uh, retinoscopy. And some examples are MEM, book, bells, stress point. Um, those are examples of when you're doing dynamic retinoscopy. And I know in a pre-registration question, somebody wanted um, clarification on what dynamic retinoscopy is. Hopefully this helps in terms of the patients fixating at a near target and the status of his or her accommodation uh, is evaluated as uh, compared to static. So what are we doing here? When we have static retinoscopy, what are we doing? We shine the streak of light into the patient's eyes and move it within the pupil, okay? And we observe how the streak appears to move in the patient's pupil, which tells us where the far point of that eye may be located. Is that far point located between me and the patient? Is that far point located virtually or behind the patient? Um, is, where is, is that far point located right at my entrance pupil? Where is that far point um, for that patient? And based on that, that's how I'm gonna determine the prescription. I'm gonna use lenses to move the far point to my eyes, the clinician, and then I'm gonna calculate the prescription the patient may need once I've gotten the far point of the patient to my entrance pupil and go from there. And we'll talk all about what it is we're doing here as we go through. What are the optics of the retinoscope? This is an important concept to go over. So there's two things to understand about the retinoscope. The first is that there's a projection system and the other one is that there's an observation system. And that's pretty much the concepts that go into a retinoscope. The projection system is to illuminate the retina. So it consists of a light source, typically a light bulb, 
a condensing lens, which can be moved, a mirror to bounce that light in a certain direction, a focusing sleeve, and then it's some type of, of source or current uh, in order to uh, provide energy for the uh, instrument. And so that whole thing together is known as the projection system. Then there's the observation system, which most simply is for the examiner to see the retinal reflex from the patient. Okay, so that's what we're working with. And here's kind of a diagram that's maybe cut a retinoscope in half so that you can see within it. Here's that light source, that light bulb. This is the condensing lens, the mirror that the light is bouncing off of. And this is heading towards the direction of the patient. Your patient would be over here, okay? The uh, observer, the clinician would be looking um, over in the side, all right? So here we have a question I, I'm interested in on what the audience thinks, and you've done very well so far. So which is more accurate? Is it the concave mirror or is it the plane mirror? Is it the sleeve up or is it the sleeve down? Which do you feel is more accurate in terms of determining? Or quite simply, are they equal? Give you guys just a little bit of time here to answer this question. We have an awesome 98 people here today, which is great. All right. Plane mirror, interesting. Plane mirror is more accurate. Okay, um, that was 54% of you uh, said plane mirror. Um, and so really, the answer is, is they're, they're, uh, they're equal in, in the sense that one technique, um, whether it's sleeve up or sleeve down, is just a different way of performing retinoscopy. Now, certainly plane mirror, as the 54% of the people responded, is more common. It's how I perform retinoscopy um, the majority of the time. But I have opportunities to go into a concave mirror, a sleeve up situation in order to check certain things or to assist me. Um, a lot of people like concave mirror, especially with high myopes that we'll talk about a little bit later or myopia in general. And so the reality is what I wanted to illustrate is that they are uh, equal in their technique. It's what you feel more comfortable with based on, it's not necessarily about accuracy, okay? It's about what you feel more comfortable with, what you find is easier to perform the skill. And certainly that tends to be plain mirror for most people just based on their training. So what are we talking about? Concave mirror is when you have the sleeve up, therefore the light coming out of the retinoscope is converging, okay? And the motion that you're gonna see is gonna be opposite uh, of what maybe you're used to with the plain mirror. Because with plain mirror and sleeve down, the light coming out of the retinoscope is a plain mirror and it's diverging. And so the motion on the retina is the same as you see it. Uh, if you see with motion or if you see against motion. It's opposite when you're doing concave mirror and sleeve up. But the reality is, is that neutrality is neutrality regardless of whether it's sleeve up or sleeve down. So they are equal in terms of their accuracy, although one technique may be slightly more comfortable for you. Um, and there are, pro there are advantages of when you want to have the sleeve up or sleeve down. And I think reality uh, based on clinical experiences and based on mentors and, and using this instrument, you're often going between the two. You're often feeling comfortable uh, and checking yourself because, again, neutrality is neutrality. So in order to get through retinoscopy, it's important that we can conceptualize uh, a patient's far point and how that relates to their refractive error. So what is the far point? It's a point in space that's conjugate to the fovea when accommodation is relaxed. Okay, a point in space that is conjugate to the fovea when accommodation is relaxed. For myopes, the far point is gonna be between the clinician and the patient. So that far point rests between the clinician and the patient. For hyperopes, however, the far point is located behind the patient. When you have SIL or, and you have astigmatism, and so the power uh, principal meridians of your eye, of your cornea, um, are more than one. It's not the same power all the way around. Um, you have two far points and um, one for each of the principal meridians. Emetropes, they have a far point at infinity. Okay, so when we know that a myopes far point is between us and the clinician, that means we can actually put ourselves at the far point if we wanted to. Um, you couldn't for hyper based on where it is. And then you're going to be using lenses to manipulate these far points to put them at you as the clinician's entrance pupil. So the more you can understand where that far point falls uh, for that patient, the better. Here's a very simple schematic that kind of goes over refractive error. As a nearsighted individual looks at infinity, therefore parallel light, the light converges in front of the retina. 
okay? And for a hyperopic eye, the light converges behind the retina, okay? Very basic concepts here related to refractive error. So let's get into how do we properly assess that reflex. This is really important for, in terms of us understanding this concept of retinoscopy and what we're seeing, what does it mean, and how am I going to handle it as a clinician, okay? So there are different characteristics of that reflex when you're looking at it. The reflex can be change its speed. It can be really fast. It can be wider or thinner. It can be brighter or duller. And those characteristics of that reflex are important for you to understand because they can relate to the magnitude of the refractive error and the type of the refractive error and where you are uh, relative to finding neutrality, okay? So for a large refractive error related to the width of the reflex, it tends to be uh, more narrow. And I will illustrate that in some examples coming ahead. When the width in a small refractive error, it tends to be wider, okay? So as you're assessing uh, your reflex, it helps to teach you a little bit about what to expect with your patients. The brilliance or brightness of it, so when you have a large refractive error, it tends to be a lot more dull. And I'll take a moment and I'll repeat this several times throughout this uh, webinar. When you get a patient um, who you have never determined their refractive error before and it ends up being very large and the reflex is dull, you might think you're already at neutrality when you start performing retinoscopy. Um, and you should learn some tools and, and tricks to, in order to check yourself to make sure that you are truly at uh, neutrality, both being comfortable with what neutrality looks like. Because these large refractive errors have been known to trick people um, they're so large and the reflex is so dull, you might actually think you're at neutrality. And so the brightness is going to vary based on the reflex and the refractive error. When a person has a small refractive error, it tends to be bright reflex. The speed of your reflex can change. Large refractive errors tends to be more slow. Smaller refractive errors, your reflex might move a little quicker. And this can help um, you, know, you as you're going through the skill and getting closer to your endpoint as you start to see the reflex get faster and faster. The direction of the reflex is very important. For hyperopes, you're going to see with motion, generally speaking. And for myopes, you're going to see against motion, generally speaking. Okay, And depending on where your sleeve is, sleeve up or sleeve down, uh, is going to relate to that type of motion. So as we move the streak within the patient's pupil, we observe how that streak appears to move. And this is your interpretation of the clinical findings. If the reflex, and let me just use the mouse here to point to the reflex. This is the reflex inside the patient's pupil. This is our streak of light, which is outside the patient's pupil. And this streak of light is going to be controlled by you as a clinician and be moving in a certain direction. This reflex inside the pupil is going to move in a certain direction based on the refractive error of that particular patient and based on where the far point is for that particular patient. So keeping in context, these examples are based off of sleeve down a plane mirror like um, retinoscope. When you have against motion, the reflex moves opposite direction than the streak and the far point is between you and the patient. Okay, so that's example here. You as the clinician are scoping from left to right in this particular example. And you notice that the reflex inside the pupil is moving from right to left, opposite or against the way that you are moving. And that would signify uh, to you that the far point is between you and the patient. With motion is this concept that refers to the reflex moves in the same direction as the streak and the far point is behind or virtual. So here the clinician controls the streak of light moving from left to right and the reflex seen within the pupil also moves from left to right. And that is what would be referred to as with motion. The reflex is moving in the same direction as you. Neutrality, here for neutrality, the reflex does not move. The pupil is filled with light for a moment in time as you scope uh, and move past it. Far point is at your entrance pupil. Now you have to keep in mind, you as the clinician and those who have done this before will know this, you wanna be going back and forth, back and forth in order to assess the reflex, um, getting a sense of it, moving it back and forth, back and forth. And if I go back and forth, back and forth, and I just see the reflex like a beacon of light coming out at me, that would indicate neutrality. If I see the beacon of light moving with me, okay, that would be with motion. Or if I see the reflex moving opposite to direction, that's against motion. 
So here's an example, a quick video. Hopefully we can watch this together here. Hopefully everybody can see this um, of what against motion is going to look like to you. And maybe many of you are already very familiar with this, but as they scope to the right, the reflex move left. As they scope to the left, the reflex moved right. So let's just pa pause here for a sec. Um, this is the reflex in here in this video and the scope of light is going on the outside of that. Let's kind of start over for a second. So in that example, uh, the light just went from right side to the left side and you saw the pupil reflex move in the opposite direction. So this represents the reflex, this represents the direction of the scope. And you can see that they're going in opposite directions, which would be against motion. All right, that's a really good example of against motion there. Here I want to show you a couple more examples of what against motion might look like when you're dealing with a low myope versus when you're dealing with a high myope. Let's watch them individually here for a second. So when you have a low myope patient, you can see that it tends to be bright, reflex, wide, and pretty fast. And what I mean by wide is edge to edge of that reflex is pretty wide. And this would indicate the characteristics of a reflex for a low myope. All right, and if we come over here and we look at a high myope, the character of the reflex change. They tend to be more dim. It tends to be narrow and slow. And what I mean by narrow is actually the very center of that reflex. You can see that the majority of the light is pretty uh, diffuse, kind of spread out. That's not the width of it. The width of it is just that center beam. Um, in the first example, it was, it was quite a bit larger. In this particular example, it's much more narrow. I was a little confused about that. It's not the entire light. It's just the center of it is very narrow. And this is an indication of somebody who would be a high myope. Okay, let's take a look at what it's gonna be like when we have with motion now. And again, for clarification, this is the reflex, okay? And the scope of light that the clinician is using is outside of that. And we are watching this reflex here. And as the scope of light moves to the right, so did the reflex. To the left, so did the reflex. To the right and to the left, we see that the reflex is moving in the same direction as us. And therefore, we have with motion here. Again, a couple of examples here of what with motion might look like when you have a low hyperope versus when you have a high hyperope. For low hyperopes, the reflex is going to have characteristics that are brighter, wide, and fast versus a high hyperope where it's dim, narrow, and slow, just like we saw for against motion. That's one meridian. Scoping the 180. This is scoping the 90 degree meridian. All right, let's take a look at the high hyperope. Much more dim, narrow, and slow when you have a high hyperope. Here we're scoping the nine degree meridian. And, and hopefully maybe this, this illustrates that you, you might feel like you're actually at neutrality in some instances. Maybe it looks like it's kind of not moving at all and just blinking towards you in that example, but it's not. That's the example of a high refractive error. And what does neutrality actually look like? It's always important to know where it is we want to go, what our endpoint should look like, okay? And so we're going to take a moment here to watch a video about what neutrality looks like so that we can know we're there. Otherwise, we might be refract, uh, performing retinoscopy for too long. So no matter what direction I move my, um, my streak, I just see this reflex kind of blinking at me, not indicating whether it's moving with me with motion or against me against motion. It just appears to uh, fill up the entire pupil space and blink right at me. And this is what we'd identify as neutrality. I have another example here using this simulator, which I'm looking to show you as we go through examples. This is a website simulator that you can kind of work through and we'll likely do that together.
putting in some lenses, I've now reached neutrality. And that's nice, bright reflex. And you're not seeing any type of motion with that. Okay. So once we as the clinician have determined um, using lenses that we've reached neutrality, okay, we then need to take into consideration our working distance. So like how far away are we from our patients? How far away we are from our patients is going to relate to the characteristics of the light that are coming out of our retinoscope. And so there are two distances that we work at when performing retinoscopy, okay? So the working distance is the lens needed for neutrality only gets the patient's far point to your entrance pupil. Once you put in your working distance, you're then able to move their far point to infinity, and that would be their refractive error. So to correct the patient's refractive error, you need to get the far point to infinity by adding your working distance lenses. If you're working at 67 centimeters, it's minus 150. If you're working at 50 centimeters, it's minus 2. The final number is your net retinoscopy findings, okay? So as you're performing retinoscopy and you're assessing the against motion and assessing the with motion and you're using lenses to then get it to neutrality, you need to then put your working distance in in order to get the person's prescription um, and their final refractive error because the working distance is going to put their far point at infinity, not at your entrance pupil, which is what you did for neutrality. Okay. And there's some, you know, suggestions in terms of how do I know that I'm sitting at 50 centimeters? How do I know that I'm at 67? Well, that's something that you as a clinician are responsible for and you need to get comfortable with. And that's where a lot of practice of this procedure comes into play. As I was growing up and learning this particular skill and as I teach it to younger individuals now going through school, we tie strings to our retinoscopes at the appropriate distance. And the string is simply feedback to let you know you know, if you've drifted back and you use your string and you're no longer reaching the patient at the appropriate distance, you've got to learn that you've drifted back, that your body language is changing or that you're getting too close. Now, there are going to be certain clinical situations where we do want to change our working distance in order to better assess the reflex. That's not what I'm talking about right now, but it is something that has to be pretty steady, your working distance. Certain clinical situations are going to lend themselves to us needing to change our working distance, but ultimately we will revert back to these two, and you should go with whatever you're comfortable with, whether it's 67 centimeters or 50 centimeters. Find what's comfortable for you, test yourself, make sure you can always hold that situation, that distance, and that's gonna keep your retinoscopy findings very consistent. A lot of the questions on pre-registration that I, that I took a look at were about, you know, how do I ma maintain my accuracy or how do I prescribe? And it really starts with being able to hold your working distance accurately and consistently as you go through practicing the skill. So there's this concept that you'll read about in the literature about gross, retino gross retinoscopy excuse me, and net retinoscopy. So gross retinoscopy is the lens that brings the patient's far point to the examiner's entrance pupil. That's occurring as you're performing your skill and getting yourself to neutrality, but that's not the final endpoint. You want to get yourself to net retinoscopy, which is the gross retinoscopy plus your working distance, minus 150 or minus 2, and the patient's final refractive error that you determine objectively as either a starting point or something to prescribe will be the net retinoscopy. So, and going through some examples here, with the sleeve down and the working distance at 50 centimeters, you see with motion with plus two lenses and you find neutrality, okay? What would be the net retinoscopy? The net retinoscopy here would be Plano, okay? With the sleeve down and the working distance at 50 centimeters, minus two diopters, you see with motion, with two diopters, you find um, neutrality. So your gross retinoscopy is plus two diopters. You need to then add in your working distance. Your working distance is minus two. Plus two plus minus two gives you Plano. Therefore, this particular individual is an emetrope. I'll digress for just a second. As you start to advance in your skill of retinoscopy, you want to be able to tell what plus two might look like even with no lenses. Get a sense of what that reflex will look like when somebody's plus two without any lenses. It's gonna be with motion, yes, but how fast is it? How bright is it? What does the characteristics of that reflex look like? So that way you can take individuals and maybe screen them in their different meridians and be like, yeah, that looks very close to what the plus two reflex would look like. And therefore you know that their um, 
have a low refractive error or might be emetropic and you can quickly identify that. So my piece of advice or a tip or trick would be as you're practicing this particular skill, learn to identify what the characteristics of the reflex look like and, um, and how it might relate to your working distance, okay? You know, with the sleeve down and the working distance at 50 centimeters, you see width motion with plus 50 lenses to get you to neutrality, okay? So you had to use plus 50 lenses to get you to neutrality, but you gotta add in your minus two lenses. Therefore, this person's net retinoscopy is minus 150. You take the plus 50 and you gotta add in the negative two, therefore you get minus 150. So even though you needed to use plus lenses to get neutrality, plus lenses to get their far point to your entrance pupil, the person is actually myopic and needs uh, minus 150. With the sleeve down and working, di uh, working distance at 50 centimeters, last example, you see with motion with a plus 450 lens to find neutrality, and therefore this person's net retinoscopy is gonna be plus 250, plus 250. Okay. Let's discuss this technique so that we can work on enhancing it uh, and having a solid foundation for practicing this particular skill. When you're performing retinoscopy, you wanna hold the retinoscope in your right hand and use your right eye to scope their right eye, the patient's right eye, okay? This is important that you perform this skill properly where it's you're using your right eye and the retinoscope in your right hand and you're scoping the patient's right eye. This places your left eye and the rest of your body outside the patient's field of vision, okay? For this particular test, as we'll get into, the patient needs to look at a distant target. Why a distance target? They need to be able to relax their accommodation. We wanna control accommodation during this skill, and so the patient should look at a distance target because we know that helps to relax accommodation. If I am using my left eye and my left hand while I scope their right eye, I'm basically right in front of them. If I'm basically right in front of them at only 50 centimeters or 67 centimeters, they're likely to be accommodating and looking right at me. And if they're accommodating, that's a variable I don't want in my uh, technique, in my test, because it could throw off my results. So this is why it's helpful if you hold the retinoscope in your right hand, using your right eye, you read their eye, okay? That places your body outside their field of vision. They can use their left eye to look at the distance target therefore controlling their accommodation. Not to mention you'll have a free hand to be able to use lenses, whether they're loose lenses, or whether they're in a foropter, or whether they're a lens rack, you'll have that hand free, okay? And you'll wanna get yourself to a point when performing this skill where you're constantly moving lenses to find neutrality, and if you're no longer moving lenses, you're done. That should be your end point because you know that no matter what type of reflex, you know how to change it, you know how to get yourself to neutrality. Um, we often see a lot of people who are learning the skill for the first time that they really spend a lot of time focusing in on that reflex one click at a time, one lens at a time, and only moving their lens rack um, one lens at a time. You don't necessarily want to do that as you advance through this skill. Maybe if it's the first couple times you're performing it, that's one thing. But as you advance through the skill, you want to move those lenses uh, quickly to get yourself. You don't want to hold yourself there scoping them for too long because you're going to affect their accommodation, you're going to affect your accommodation, and that can change your results, all right? So try to work quickly. You want to scope all meridians uh, of the person's eye in order to be able to pick up astigmatism. Again, a lot of the questions that came in on pre-registration were about how do I determine the prescription or how do I detect um, whether or not the person has some cell. We'll get into that a little bit more detail in just a little bit. But one of the ways that you're gonna to wanna to start off by is scoping all the meridians and taking a look at that reflex. How does that reflex look to you? If it looks different, faster, brighter, um, wider in one meridian as compared to another meridian where it's now dim, it's slower, and it's more narrow, that's an indication that this person has different powers in those different meridians. And if they have different powers in those meridians, they're definitely gonna have astigmatism, okay? So paying attention to the reflex and making sure you don't just stick to one meridian and just scope one meridian. You wanna scope all the way around, finding the different principal meridians and then neutralizing those. You wanna neutralize the meridian with the most plus least minus uh, first, okay? This is especially true if you're using uh, minus silk. For the audience members who use plus sill, you wanna do uh, the most minus, uh, least plus first, okay? But for our case with minus sill, you're gonna neutralize the meridian with the most plus, least minus first, and then you'll go from there. 
look uh, at perpendicular meridians. Meridian two, is it neutral? Yes, you have a spherical eye. So when you're scoping one meridian and you find neutrality and then you go 90 degrees away, we're gonna assume they have regular astigmatism. If you go 90 degrees away and you see that it still looks neutrality, well then those meridians are of equal power, you have a spherical eye. If they're not, if you still see some motion after you've achieved neutrality of one meridian, then you know that you have powers in these different meridians, okay, and you have astigmatism. Meridian two, you know, really should show against motion if you're working in minus cell. So when I neutralize one meridian, say I see with motion, I see with motion, I see with motion, I know I neutralize with motion with plus. And now I've gotten to where it's reversed, it's gone against motion, too much plus, I go back, I found neutrality, excellent. I now go to my second principal meridian and I see against motion right now. That's what I want if I have a phoropter with only minus cell because I only have minus lenses now in my phoropter for my second principal meridian. If I only have minus lenses, I can only neutralize against motion. Okay, remember that. If I only have minus lenses, I can only neutralize against motion. If I have with motion, when I go to my second principal meridian, I don't have any lenses to neutralize that with in a phoropter with minus cell. That's okay, not a problem. What you did is you simply chose the wrong principal meridian first. So go now that you have this meridian, neutralize that, and when you go back to your first meridian, you'll see that it's against motion, okay? So you don't have to be too hung up on it. This is certainly something that we see in people who are learning the skill for the very first time is they get very, you know, uh, stressed out or anxious about making sure they find that first meridian that's most plus or least minus. You don't need to worry about that. Pick a meridian, find neutrality. When you go to your second principal meridian, if you don't see the motion that you want or the lenses that you have available to neutralize it, you just have to reverse your axis by 90 degrees, okay? You just, have, you just chose the wrong principal meridian first and you should be able to quickly adjust to that, okay? That doesn't make any sense. I'm more than happy to clarify that, but I think that's an important concept of clinically being able to de develop the skill faster. With clinic, uh, many of you know that you have so many demands in terms of getting through the examination, see as many patients as you possibly can, provide enough help for everybody, okay? And one of those ways of getting faster is not agonizing yourself over these two principal meridians in terms of which is the most plus or least minus meridian. Just pick one, find neutrality. When you go to your second meridian, if it's not the motion that you want, you can adjust yourself. And I think that's how you'll get through retinoscopy faster and a good tip to work on it. And then once you've found neutrality in both principal meridians, then you're gonna add in your working distance. One um, comment to add is some people were, were asking about, you know, how do I keep track of my meridians carefully or how do I record down the axis properly and I don't mess it up? And that's a good question. If you're working with loose lenses or if you are working with a lens rack, you are gonna to need to put these in optical crosses. The more practice, the more able you're able to do that inside your head. But if you need to write them down, just remember that you're neutralizing one meridian at a time and put those on an optical cross, and then you can convert it to whatever um, prescription you write in, minus cell or plus cell. Okay, let's go streaking. Retinoscopy motion depends on the patient's refractive error, refractive error the status of accommodation, lenses placed in front of the patient's eyes, and your working distance. In terms of status of accommodation, okay, there are several different uh, techniques used to control accommodation. A lot of people like to fog the eye that they are, uh, the left eye when they start performing retinoscopy on the right eye, they like to fog the left eye in order to control accommodation. I highly recommend this. Only about a doctor to a doctor and a half. That doesn't mean you should just go ahead and throw plus into the phoropter for the left eye. That person could easily be plus two or plus 150 and you don't know. You have to go to that left eye and look at the type of reflex, okay? and actually throw in some lenses in order to get it to um, about a blur of adopter to adopter and a half in order to control their accommodation, okay? And that's also true if they're a really high myope, you might wanna give them some minus to lower that so that they don't go tonic accommodation on you. Another way of controlling the accommodation is to put up a, a red-green uh, distance target um, and a big E. Uh, there was a question in the, the pre-registration about deuterochrome and how to properly do the deuterochrome test. You know, unfortunately, I'm not doing subjective refraction in this particular webinar. This webinar is focused on the fundamentals, theory, and the technique of retinoscopy. If you are looking more to understand subjective refraction and deuterochrome test, that would probably be for a different webinar, okay? Um, but here we have the moving of the streak vertically, horizontally, and obliquely. You need to be comfortable with being able to rotate your streak. And this is where, you know, spot versus streak come in. 
um, in terms of retinoscopes. I've only ever used a streak retinoscope. I've never used a spot. I know spot um, certainly uh, has helped a lot of people and is a very good technique. But the streak, they say, is a little bit easier in terms of determining that the refractive error, um, specifically as it relates to astigmatism and, and getting the axis down correctly. Um, so a lot more people are using streak retinoscopy, and I think that that's uh, important. So appearance of the retinoscopy reflex. When you're far from neutrality, like about four diopters, again, it's going to be dull and it's going to be slow. When further from neutrality, even greater than like six diopters, it almost appears as if there's no reflex. Okay, and I'm going to show you a simulated example of that, example seven. It almost looks like there's no reflex altogether, and you might even think you're at neutrality because of that. And you need to be careful. Large refractive errors can easily trip people up as thinking that they're at neutrality. What you should do is throw in a lot of lenses, and this is one technique. Throw in a lot of lenses, either direction, just to see if you can start seeing some type of reflex and some type of motion of that reflex. And then once you get motion of that reflex, you'll know what direction to go in, either continue in the direction of the lenses that you place or go in the opposite direction, okay? Sometimes people like to get a lot closer. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about radical retinoscopy where you get about 10 centimeters away and you've really changed your working distance in order to better see what type of reflex. That works well for high refractive errors, okay? And you can actually back yourself up back to your normal working distance once you've gotten the reflex and you've been putting in some lenses, okay? Between one diopter to about three and a half diopters from neutrality, you usually uh, see a line. And as you get closer to a neutrality, around less than a diopter, the reflex is wide, almost begins to fill the pupil. And even closer to neutrality, the reflex moves very fast and it's bright. I highly recommend when you're performing retinoscopy, another way to get faster, another way to get more accurate with this technique is bracketing. So what I'd want you to do is when you see a particular type of motion, say it's with motion, you just keep adding in plus until that reflex goes against motion and then you go back and now it's a bookend you know you don't need to go past that you've gotten to it quickly and now you can spend a couple uh, of seconds um, half a minute to refine that and really pay attention to get it to you know a very accurate spot but I wouldn't waste time until I've gotten my reflex to reverse okay and that can be helpful what orientation should your streak be at this is an important question to ask yourself how do I know if my patient has astigmatism? Well, there's gonna be characteristics to the reflex that you see that are gonna lend itself to understanding whether a person has astigmatism. Um, the thickness and brightness of the reflex as you rotate it, we already mentioned that. Pay attention to all the different meridians. As you rotate your reflex, you'll wanna pay attention to the characteristics of that reflex. If you see a break, what does a break mean? Well, if you look at this example right here, you see that maybe you're scoping at 95 or 100 here, um, that's the orientation of your streak. You're actually scoping the meridian that's 90 degrees away from that. But the reflex inside the pupil has broken away from where the alignment of your streak is, okay? They really should be together. They should be lined up together, not lined up here in this example, lined up here in this example, and that's what you want. That's how you know you're scoping the right meridian. That's how you know you're at the axis. So pay attention closely to whether or not there's a break in the reflex. After you neutralize one meridian, you rotate the streak and find the meridian that is not neutralized, okay? And that's important. So here's an example case on this simulator program that is a website that you may be able to have access to. And so in this particular example, first step, scope both meridians. So here we're scoping the 180 degree meridian. Now we're rotating our reflex and we're scoping the 90 degree meridian. Pick the meridian with most minus least plus, okay, if you're working in plus sill form, or it would be most plus least minus if you're working in minus sill form. Again, these are interchangeable. You can easily go back and forth. Neutralize the motion. Go to reversal of the motion if unsure. And then neutralize perpendicular meridian, and then you're going to add in your working distance. So here we have against motion still. We're going to continue to add in some minus lenses. Oh, that looks pretty close to neutrality go up a little bit more, the motion's now reversed. We were dealing with against motion the whole time and now we see with motion, we know we need to go back down. Yes, that looks pretty good in terms of neutrality right there. Let's rotate our streak in order to check the other meridian. Turns out our other principal meridian also looks to be at neutral right now. 
So I think that we are at neutrality, and this is a spherical eye. If I click this button, I'll see our refractive error minus seven. Minus five with minus two working distance is gonna get us to minus seven, okay? Let's go through another example. You want, again, scope both meridians. Pick the meridian with the most plus, least minus for minus cell, or most minus, least plus for plus cell. Neutralize the motion. Here we have with motion. Still have with motion. Increase more plus with motion. Reflex is starting to change a little bit here. All the way up to about 550, our reflex has gotten faster. It's gotten brighter. Well, that looks pretty close to neutrality right there. Maybe go a little bit more. Let's see if this reverses. It does. We now have against motion. Back it down a little bit. Looks like neutrality. What's our next thing? We got to reverse and check all prints and meridians. Sure enough, looks pretty neutral right there. So plus six with a working distance of minus two would give us plus four of a spherical eye there, okay? So those are just some simulated examples of how you kind of want to work on your technique here as you go through it. We have some more examples. I have case three, case four, case five, case six, and case seven. And in the interest of time, because we only have an hour of lecture, I want to show you where you can go to actually um, work on some simulated examples of this case. So we're going to leave the PowerPoint presentation for a very quick second. I'm going to bring up a website that you could use. Um, because we just don't have time to necessarily go through each of these individual cases and they're kind of the same What I'd like to enable you to do is be able to go to a website that can allow you to practice and create any type of cases that you want here So I'm just going to quickly exit this PowerPoint presentation and then come over to this website here. So this website is oops, Hopefully you can still see me Yep, we can see you. Okay, great. So this website is idocs.ko.uk uh, forward slash ophthalmology, and you'll be able to find what's known as the retinoscopy simulator. And I highly encourage you. I think this will enable you to work on your skills. You can determine what type of patient do you want. Do you want a myope? Do you want a hyperope? Do you want a myopic astigmatism, compound myopic astigmatism, hyperopic astigmatism, compound hyperopic? And then you can go ahead and change the lenses um, as you see fit. You can work in either plus or minus cell. You can hide the answer so you don't have to see it. And then what you simply do is work on this type of reflex. Okay, so here I have with motion right there, right? And my orientation uh, streak is vertical, therefore I'm scoping the 180 degree meridian. If I click these arrows here, and you can just play around with this, I now am able to scope a different meridian, okay? I'm able to scope the 90 degree meridian. And then what you simply do is you put lenses in and you assess that reflex. I still got width there, still got width there, I'm increasing the magnitude. Width, my reflex is getting better, et cetera. Now I went against, I might back it off, okay? And so, you know, I'll make this, uh, this website link uh, also available so that everybody can, can kind of get to it. Uh, but I think this is a really great technique in order to practice your skills a little bit. And that looks like it's neutral there, okay? Rather than kind of walking you through specific examples, this uh, will enable you to create all your own examples. I do think it's, it's helpful to take a look at this example I put together called example seven, okay? Let's take a look at example seven that I put together. Um, and what you'll see here is an example of what can happen when the reflex appears to be non-existent or super dull. So we just scoped the 180 degree meridian, we didn't see much, we're now scoping 90, it's almost like we don't see much. So what should we do? I highly encourage you to be able to just throw in lenses and then be able to better assess any type of motion that comes up because now we're starting to see some type of dull reflex. And the reason that it looked so difficult at first is because this refractive error is probably of pretty large magnitude. And so now I can actually see some break. I think this is a good example of a break. If I go back just a touch, see how the reflex is not in line with my streak, when the reflex is not in line with my streak, that's a break and that's an indication that there might be some astigmatism there and you're gonna need to orient your streak differently.
here we are changing the streak, the orientation of our streak, and now we got better alignment there. And now we're able to assess this reflex a lot better. It's more comfortable to what we normally are at, okay? I got some more slides that I wanna go over, but that was just to illustrate to you when you have very large refractive errors, you might just need to throw in some lenses and start begin uh, figuring out what's going on. Many of you are very interested, I know, in how to deal with more complicated situations. What do I do if there's an opacity? What do I do if there's corneal edema? How do I still perform this skill? Um, those are really excellent questions. And what you can do is kind of alternate your working distance. You can kind of come off axis a little bit. I want to get into some tricks, uh, tips and tricks as we go through here. So problems with redding, you might have a poor reflex, high refractive error, dense medial opacities, uncooperative patient, or scissoring. I know that's also a big concept. Scissoring, what does that mean? That means that like, as you are scoping, the reflex appears to like split into two. It appears to like scissor itself. And that can be very confusing. Is it against motion? Is it with motion? You know, what am I seeing here? It can be very difficult. So this is kind of an example of what you might see when you go through scissoring where it kind of breaks off. My biggest piece of advice to you is stay into the center of the pupil and keep your strokes maybe smaller. Don't go and make these large strokes, okay, with your retinoscopy, and don't look towards the edges of the pupil. If you stay towards the center of the pupil, you make smaller uh, strokes, you'll be able to better assess and not be uh, so bothered by scissoring. Scissoring, though, is a clinical indication that maybe there's quite a bit of astigmatism or maybe this person has keratoconus. Okay, so if I see scissoring when I'm performing retinoscopy, I do my best to get to my endpoint. I do my best to get to neutrality. But I also keep in mind, hmm, I got to look at the okay values. I got to look if I'm able to get this person to 2020 because they may have keratoconus that's been undiagnosed and I can pick it up through retinoscopy. So here are some tips. Retinoscopy, if you are not getting a red reflex, consider reducing the working distance only momentarily, okay? That's where that radical retinoscopy might come in. Or doing an off-axis retinoscopy. You don't typically want to do off-axis. You wanna stay down the visual axis, but if you need to, you can go off-axis in order to help yourself maybe look around an opacity. Bracketing the lenses at large power intervals can be really helpful and a fast way to get to where you want. Reading over the existing glasses can give you a sense of where you're at. And again, that's what knowing what, you know, maybe um, plus two looks like uh, with your streak, knowing your reflexes, because you would know that if I just put in my working distance, that reflex is going to go away. I know the characteristics of that reflex. I'm familiar with the characteristics of that reflex. Check if you are over minus by adding plus lenses and repeating the VA. In a subjective situation, you know, when you put your net retinoscopy in and you're able to ask them what they can see, sometimes they see 2020 that you might have over minus them. Add a little plus uh, into that to see if it reduces their vision as it should, indicating that they're not over minus. If the vision stays exactly the same way, that's an indication that you did over minus them because they wouldn't need that strong of a prescription. If you are getting in the habit of over minusing people consistently, it could be because of your working distance and you'll wanna check that. It could be because you're putting in minus two lenses, but maybe you're only working at minus 50. And so if you're constantly over minusing somebody, take a look at your working distance. If you have small changes in the pupil, you want to suspect a little bit of latent hyperopia, okay? So if the pupil during retinoscopy appears to be changing in size, maybe it's getting a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, it's moving on you, that can relate to some accommodation, that can relate to the fact that they might be hyperopic. If you get a large pupil, okay, they're very dilated, or you're performing a cycloplegic retinoscopy, which I highly encourage you to do at times, you want to stay towards the center of the pupil, okay? You're going to get more aberrations as you go towards the edges, and that can throw off your reflex. So try to stay towards the center of the pupil. What are some of the most common mistakes I've seen people perform retinoscopy on? They perform the technique off axis, so they tend to be very tilted. They don't look right down the barrel, okay? I said you have to do that sometimes in more difficult situations, but in, um, in working on your technique, stay on axis. They choose the wrong target, not far, not far enough or too small. They block the patient's view. This happens all the time. You need to, if you can communicate to your patient effectively, that's great. If you're not, though, you need to be aware of whether or not you're blocking them. The patient looks at the retinoscopy light, not at the distance target, and they take too long. Therefore, the patient's accommodation will change during the assessment, and you will likely over minus because your accommodation might change too. A lot of new people learning the skill tend to creep a little bit too close, so they tend to go too far away. Again, you can check your working distance, and I highly encourage you to do that. Not accurately determine the presence of astigmatism. 
inaccurately determine the orientation of the main meridians, confuse the axis of the corrective sill, and hold the lens rack too far away from the eye or loose lenses too far away. You want to try to get those as close to the eye as possible. Therefore, you're not changing the effective power of the lens. Okay. Hold the, the rack from the lens rather than the handle, and that can dirty your lens. Incorrectly uh, subtract or do not subtract the working distance to obtain the net retinoscopy. And then report the gross ret when your preceptor asks for your results. Okay. You always want to keep track of uh, what's your net retinoscopy, what's your gross retinoscopy, and put in that working distance as it can have an effect, okay? Again, kind of the goal and the focus and objective of the lecture was to provide a solid foundation um, for people. I understand everybody's background and competencies are probably different with retinoscopy. I'm going to open up the question and answer box with an opportunity to maybe address some of those more specific questions as we have about five minutes remaining uh, in this hour. Again, I highly encourage you to submit any questions to cybersite.org. Specifically, you have a clinical question that might require some detail to get into. Um, but I do hope that you get a chance to do that. And hopefully this provided a, some foundation here. So I'm opening the question and answer box. And uh, let's see what we have open here. Could you please explain hypertrophy? Um, let's see here. Thank you for changing that. Um, Difference between pupil fill and crossfit. How do you determine? Some of these are just a little bit uh, difficult to interpret, so I'm just trying to kind of read through them and figure out one that I can interpret properly. Okay. okay, that's a good question. How can I know the most plus least minus in the beginning? Okay, most plus least minus is what you're going to want to do for somebody who uh, you're working in minus cell. And I think that's a really important question. Is you're not yet familiar with the reflexes and their characteristics. And so in the beginning, I would highly just suggest pick a meridian and work on your skills of being able to achieve neutrality. Once you get neutrality and you reverse it, if it's not the motion that you want, so if you're working in minus cell and you're going to your second principal meridian and you see with motion, you just chose the wrong meridian from the beginning and then just neutralize that meridian now. And when you reverse it, you'll see against motion. So for those who are starting off, and you're like, how am I going to know which is the most plus, least minus? Excellent question. Pick a meridian. Find neutrality. When you go to your second principal meridian, if you don't get the type of motion you want, you just happen to choose wrong. Okay. Oh, the questions are really coming in now. These are great questions. You guys have been an awesome audience. Where'd you rip on? Some of them are coming in fast here. The working distance is it a minus sign or you just subtract the working distance? Okay, that's a good question here. So you're gonna add a negative number, okay? The light coming out of the retinoscope um, is affecting, is divergent, and therefore there's power from the retinoscope. So when you wanna put your working distance, therefore backing the patient's refractive error up to infinity, you're gonna add in a negative number, okay? You're gonna add in a negative number to the uh, phoropter or to your optical cross or whatever it might be, you're gonna add in a negative number, okay? That was a good question. Oh, what are my preferred targets at um, six meters? Um, that's a good question. So I typically just use a large E and I'll put a red green filter in. That's just been my training. Um, but sometimes, you know, a patient may not be able to even see that at all. So um, any type of target that they can somewhat um, look at and pay attention to, you know, for a lot of kids, I work to just try to get a video going or some type of uh, animation or characteristics because I want to keep them distracted. You want to keep them looking at a distance target. Um, that can be really helpful. One of the questions I did want uh, to address in this last couple minutes that came up on the pre-registration is, you know, with auto refraction coming out these days, why do, why do we even need retinoscopy anymore? If I can get a starting refraction through um, an auto refraction, a click of a button, retinoscopy doesn't seem to be too significant. And I, you know, I just want to take a moment to really stress the importance of retinoscopy. It's a very important skill because it's dynamic. You're able to look at the reflex. You're able to look at the refractive system as you're doing it. You might be able to pick opacities up better. You might have a better sense of the refractive error. You don't get that through automation, okay? Not everybody is able to sit and be in an automated um, autorefractor. Maybe you have a handheld, um, and that's great, or maybe you are able to get them in there. But for many situations that I find myself in, wheelchair or uh, they're bedridden or whatnot, retinoscopy is an important skill to have. I work closely with a pediatric ophthalmologist at my community health center. 
pediatric ophthalmologist, well known. He's the chief of uh, a major city hospital here. And when you ask him what's his most important skill, he will always tell you it's retinoscopy. And that's coming, that's coming from somebody who's done this for quite a long time. It takes a lot of skill. It takes a lot of practice. I know you guys can do it. Hopefully, this helped provide some foundations for you to work through and keep track of. And really, it's a motor skill. And really, it's getting out there and doing this as much as possible. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I look forward to maybe answering some more questions and, and working with um, Orbis and CyberSight to help address some of these questions. Um, but I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Benson. Thank you.